In this video, we're going to talk about the ecological roles of fungi. So first of all, you usually find fungi in dark, moist environments, such as on the forest floor. So if you've ever gone for a walk through the woods or gone hiking, you probably see fungi all around you. Fungi can live in most environments, but the reason why they really thrive in these dark, moist environments is because that's where the dead stuff is. I remember that a lot of fungi are saprobes. And saprobes are decomposers. So fungi do well in environments, but there's a lot of dead stuff. So dead leaves, dead debris, even dead animals. As we mentioned on the previous slide, fungi act as decomposers, so they are saprobes. And one of their kind of main or most important ecological roles is to decompose and recycle different compounds and atoms in the environment. So if you recall from maybe a previous biology class, we have these molecules that we call macromolecules. Sometimes they are also called biomolecules, and sometimes they are referred to as polymers, although there is an exception to that rule. So we'll just stick with macromolecules. And these are the four main kind of classes or groups of molecules that make up living organic matter. So we have complex carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids, and lipids. These molecules are called macromolecules because they are big. So that kind of prefix of macro means big. And each one of these macromolecules is made up of smaller components that we can refer to as subunits. You have maybe also heard them referred to as monomers, which is the case for all of them except for lipids, which don't have a true monomer. So the subunits of complex carbohydrates are going to be the monosaccharides, The subunits of proteins are amino acids. The subunits of nucleic acids are nucleotides. And the subunits of lipids are glycerol and fatty acids for the most part. Now, in addition to these subunits, each of these molecules is also made up of atoms. So we can take these big molecules, break them down into smaller molecules, and then break them down into their individual atomic element components. So all of these kind of biological or organic compounds contain the atoms known as carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and then a lot of them have phosphorus and nitrogen. And then there may be some sulfur and some other molecules or atoms, I'm sorry, other atoms in smaller amounts. But these are kind of the main elements that make up organic molecules, that make up living things. So when an organism dies, these decomposers come in, and fungi are just one example of a decomposer, but also things like bacteria can be decomposers. But they can come in and they can break down these bigger macromolecules into their subunits and then further break them down into their atoms. 
So these atoms then get released into the environment so that other living organisms can use them for whatever purpose, so maybe to make new molecules. So essentially there is a set number of matter or amount of matter on the planet and these decomposers just help to recycle it so that the carbon atoms that were in the tree maybe that died now get broken down and released so that uh, another plant maybe can come along, pick up that carbon and use it to make organic compounds for itself. Nitrogen and phosphorus are especially considered limiting nutrients. And so it's really important that these nutrients get released from these dead organisms and returned to the environment so that other organisms can have access to them. And nitrogen and phosphorus are needed for making things like the nucleotides, which allow us to make nucleic acids like DNA and RNA. They're also needed to make amino acids, which we need in order to make proteins. Fungi also form mutualistic relationships with other organisms. On this slide, we're going to focus on the symbiotic relationship that fungi have with plants. And this form of symbiosis is mutualistic which means that both organisms benefit from the relationship. And when a fungus is in a symbiotic relationship with the root of a plant, it's known as a mycorrhizae. And there are two different types of mycorrhizae. There are endomycorrhizae, endo means inside, and ectomycorrhizae, and ecto means outside. So if a fungus is an endomycorrhizae, it's also known as an arbuscular mycorrhizae. And this is a fungus that actually grows inside the cells of the roots of a plant. And all of the fungi that have this endomycorrhizae relationship are found in the phylum glomeromycota. And you can see this arbuscular or endomycorrhizae on this picture here. This big blue glob here is going to be the fungus. And then these are the cells that are making up the root of the plant. Fungi that are ectomycorrhizae are going to be found growing around the roots, but not inside the actual cells. And the ectomycorrhizae fungi can be associated with a couple of different phyla, including ascomycota, basidiomycota, and zygomycota. So you can see on this picture here, we have the, the cells of the plant root here. And then this kind of bluish purple structure is the or are the hyphae of the fungus that is wrapped around the outside of the root you can also see that the hyphae kind of jut in between the cells of the of the root so they're not going into the cells but they are going kind of in between and around those cells of the root You can also see the ectomycorrhizae on kind of a macroscopic level by looking at these two pictures here. So you can see this kind of yellowish um, kind of stringy structure here. That's going to be the fungi that are surrounding the root of a plant. In this other picture here, you can see the kind of the, maybe the thicker, yellower kind of structures are going to be the root of the plant. And then all these are all this kind of like fluffy stuff here. That's going to be the ectomycorrhizae fungi that are surrounding the roots. And as I mentioned before, both organisms benefit from this relationship. 
In fact, there are some plants and fungi that are not able to live independently of each other. They benefit because the fungi, remember they're the decomposers, they're breaking down those larger macromolecules into their smaller components, and it provides those nutrients to the plant. And some of those nutrients are critically important to the plant, such as the nitrogen and phosphorus. The fungi benefit because plants can do photosynthesis, and so they are able to make carbohydrates that the fungi can then feed off of. The fungi and the plants can also provide each other with protection in the form of things like thorns or spines or the production of toxins. Lichens are another example of fungi having a mutualistic relationship with another organism. Um, in this case, the fungus is mutualistic with a photosynthetic organism, which is usually algae. Remember that algae are classified as protists. And you've probably seen lichens if you've been out in the woods hiking around. You often see them on rocks, like you can see in this picture here on the left. And this is another example of a relationship where the fungi and the algae are not able to live independently of each other. The fungi that are usually involved in this relationship are from the phyla Ascomycota or Basidiomycota. And you can see from the picture here that lichens can take different forms and colors. Lichens are these really interesting organisms that can be used biologically in a couple of ways. First of all, lichens are sensitive to air pollution. So scientists can actually go out and look at the variety of lichen and the abundance of lichen to kind of monitor the air quality in an area. Lichens also serve the ecological roles of being food for caribou and reindeer because lichens can live in harsh environments like the tundra and the taiga, which is where the caribou and reindeer live. Lichens also provide shelter for small invertebrate organisms. Commercially, the pigments in lichens can be used to dye cloth or to make litmus paper. And litmus paper is just a special paper where when you dip it in an acid or a base, the pigments on the paper change color to indicate what the pH level is. And so the pigments on that paper comes from lichen. Fungi can also form mutualistic relationships with animals, most specifically insects. So fungi and arthropods, and an arthropod is basically just a, a category of animals that includes insects. So joint-legged invertebrates with a chitinous exoskeleton. And once again, this is a mutualistic relationship. So both the fungus and the arthropod benefits from this relationship. The fungus benefits because it receives nutrients from the insect, and it also catches a ride. So it's able to basically get resources by moving around in its environment rather than being stuck in one place. Because it, the fungus is also moving around with the arthropod, it also helps to disperse their spores across a greater area. The arthropod benefits from the relationship because it gets protection from predators and pathogens. And this could be due to the fungus creating toxins or tasting bad, or even potentially releasing antimicrobial compounds. Fungi can also be part of the food web. So for example, animals eat fungi, including us humans, we eat some mushrooms. And by eating the fungi, we are actually getting nutrients from that organism. Interestingly, some of the spores of some fungi, after they are ingested, they might not be completely digested. And this means that the spores will actually pass through the digestive tract of the animal that ate it, and then it will be released in the animal's scat or poop. This helps to spread the spores to different areas to allow the fungi to germinate in a wider kind of area because they're no longer stuck in one place. 
some spores actually require the kind of the transport through a digestive tract before they can germinate. And it, this might be due to either the enzymes or the acid or just the mechanical processes that help to kind of remove that protective coat and release the spores inside when the animal defecates.